Our speaker this evening is Stephen Glover, who came to our attention, highly recommended because of his knowledge of the topic and also his manner of delivery. Steve is the archivist at the Royal Canadian Legion branch in uh, Barrie. He's uh, constantly in demand by groups um, in that city and beyond for his knowledge and his expertise and his delivery. So we are truly delighted to have him with us this evening. Welcome, Steve. Um, this is the Collingwood District Historical Society. Mary Lou is going to help me get the, the, the slides up here in a second here. So uh, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Uh, I think it was about a year ago that uh, uh, Bruce called me up and said, uh, we'd like you to come and speak with us. Uh, I said, sure, when would that be? He says, November 2018. That was like back in, I think, November 2017. I said, I'm, I might be dead then. <laughs> he says, well, if you're not, could you please come? <laughs> I'm here, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Okay, and by the way, uh, I, I do play the part of Santa Claus, so I do look like him a lot. I just spent two days down in Toronto in a photography studio, staring at little boys and girls uh, and uh, saying, ho, ho, ho. Okay, appreciate that, okay. So this opening slide here, it's called Remembering the Great War, and it's just a very cenotaph from last year. And it was cold, very cold, and uh, a police constable named Sarah Bamford took a picture of the cenotaph, and I'm sure she photoshopped the sky a little bit. But it was so fantastic, it now appears on all sorts of uh, flags and uh, things around the city of Barrie, if you find yourself in Barrie in the month of November. Next slide, please. In the First World War, Canada fought all their battles on the Western Front, essentially northern France and in Belgium. And uh, while we sh shipped out 35,000 uh, people in the uh, fall of 1914, they were deemed that they needed additional training. So they didn't get to see any action until about January, February, when they moved into France. And then their first major battle was the Battle of Ypres. Now that might be difficult to see, but it's really just highlighting all the battles that took place throughout the war, going down to November of 1918, four and a half years of war, if you will. But the Second Battle of Ypres, uh, then they moved into saint eloy in 1916, where the Second Division got hit hard, and it was painful. Third, uh, the Battle of Mount Sorel, where the Third Division took a lot of pain, and the First Division came to their aid. And then the Battle of the Somme in July, November 1916, and then things started to reverse in 1917, starting at Vimy Ridge. Next slide, please. So this is the Western Front, and the red line to the far right is where the war ended up. But primarily for four and a half years of war, there was about a 30-mile uh, variance between the battles uh, across that area, running from the, uh, the um, English uh, Channel down to the border of Switzerland. So all of those battles in that area, and when you think about World War II, and it was a global situation, and Canada was involved in Italy and in Germany and Holland, etc. Here we had a war that was essentially a trench war, static for the greater part of the war. Next slide, please. And so, out of Simcoe County, uh, we had several battalions that were raised, one of them being the 157th Battalion, and I do have a slide about that in a moment's time. But I found this fifth photograph in the Simcoe County Archives showing the lads walking down the streets in the summer of 1916, getting ready, doing the training, needing what they do. Next slide, please. And then the reality of the war, and I found this colorized slide in the middle showing three dead soldiers in a trench, and uh, essentially it's part of a trench, a dugout where they were sleeping. And then in the last 100 days of the war, I started to look through all the um, uh, newspapers in Barrie, especially the uh, Northern Advance, no longer newspaper, and started to look at all the casualties from across Simcoe County. And I looked at the numbers, 
Killed in action over the last 100 days, 91. Died of wounds, 37. Wounded, 328. Gassed, 33. Missing, 14. <coughs> taken prisoner, 9. And taken ill, 16. <clears throat> I think if I put all the numbers together, it's somewhere over between five and 600 people in the last 100 days. And this was a reality that World War I brought to us. And today, as I think about where people are, what they know about the First World War, I know that eight years ago I knew about Vimy Ridge and practically nothing more and decided to take it upon myself to learn a lot about it. So the last eight years, I think I've read nothing but First World War and Second World War stuff. And my wife says I need to branch out a bit. <laughs> Next slide, please. So, four and a half years of war, and the statistics that came out of that war, as reported by Tim Cook in his two-volume history of World War I, and he identifies that something like 54,000 uh, died killed in action, KIA, another almost 8,000 died of wounds, 173,000 wounded. And then, out of the 620-odd thousand people that enlisted, something like 345,000 of those men got overseas to France and then moving into Belgium and northern France. And six and a half out of every ten were either killed or maimed. And that blew me away. And you think about it, they didn't join up for a nine-month tour. They, th they had to do it for the duration of the war. So if you were lucky enough when you started out in 1915 to survive the war, unbelievable, four and a half years of war. Next slide, please. And they got to play in the mud. <laughs> Trenches. From the book Martin Gilbert wrote, a uh, British uh, historian, about the Somme, he talks about a Lance Sergeant Hector Munro who had written an essay called The Square A. And I'll read it out for you. It says, in narrow dug support trenches, when thaw and heavy rain have come suddenly atop of a frost, when everything is pitch dark around you and you can only stumble about and feel your way against streaming mud walls, when you have to go down on hands and knees in several inches of soup-like mud to creep into a dugout, when you stand up, when you stand deep in mud, lean against mud, Grasp mudslide objects with mud cake fingers, wink mud away from your eyes, and shake it out of your ears. Bite muddy biscuits with muddy teeth, then at least you're in a position to understand thoroughly what it feels like to wallow like an elk or a bison. And that's what they were doing. They spent six days in the front trenches, <coughs> six days in the rear trenches, and then six days behind that and then they kept doing it again and again and again. Then they got a, a change of underwear, somebody else's that had just been washed out at the end of that time, and then they went back at it again. And you can imagine, because it was winter, and it was summer, and it was fall, and it was raining, and it was always mud. Next slide, please. And so they took uh, joy in the small things of life. And I know that when my father was fighting in World War II, he wrote letters often about how he was thankful that the church had sent him some more cigarettes, or the uh, A&P store who would send him some more cigarettes. And so Cigarettes is the name of the poem. And this was a gentleman named Frank Dixon who fought uh, uh, out of Manitoba, or came from Manitoba, who died in the last 100 days of the war. Uh, people could, oops, it's, it's, it, this thing has a mind of its own. Can you really just go back? OK, I'm just going to read you the opening stanza here, because I think it's kind of cool. When the cold is making ice cream of the marrow in your bones, when you're shaking like a jelly and your feet are dead as stones, when your clothes and boots and blankets and your rifle and your kit are soaked from hell to breakfast and the dugout where you sit is leaking like a basket and upon the muddy floor the water lies in filthy pools six inches deep or more. Though life seems cold and miserable and all the world is wet, you always get through somehow if you got a signal. <laughs> so these guys survived for four and a half years of war and the small pleasures in life, and that's an interesting slide. Next, next slide, please. Here's a story of a, a gentleman from named Roy Brown who enlisted with the 157th out of Barry, and uh, he writes a letter home to his mom, 
And these letters I find out in the newspapers, and like you do at the Historical Association, you go to the original sources and you're thrilled. <laughs> I know it's going to jump, is it? <laughs> you're thrilled to, to, to find things like this. But here's Roy writing a letter on October 31 to his mother, and I, it really grabbed me because it says, a fellow sees so much and lives so close to death at times, it makes him think seriously. Makes him think seriously. <laughs> yeah. I often think of you over in that peaceful country. I left but a few short months ago, and I trust that my life may be spared to go back and live in peace. And that's what they all did. They all thought about home. They always thought about home. And when they wrote, they wanted to talk about home. But uh, in the case of Roy, uh, he died uh, a couple weeks later because he was killed at Passchendaele, a uh, shrapnel uh, shell and inhaled gas, and he died at a casualty clearing station on the 14th of November. So essentially that sentence where he said, I, it makes him think seriously, it made me think seriously about what these men did. Next slide, please. So I know uh, that you, we've talked about some of the resources that are out there for you if you've got uh, ancestors that fought in the First World War. And one of them is the Library and Archives Canada, where they've documented 620 odd thousand uh, soldiers now. They have them on a database. Um, uh, it's listed there. I don't expect you to have to copy it all, but Library and Archives Canada is where it's at. And they've just completed that so that all of the First World War service records are now online. So if you have an ancestor and you haven't had the opportunity, please do so and you'll be able to get his full service records. That'll be typically if the person survives somewhere between 60 and 90 pages of PDF documentation. Uh, if he was killed in action, sometimes a lot less depending upon when he was killed in action. Next slide, please. There's also the virtual war memorial where if anyone paid the supreme sacrifice, whether it be First World War, Second World War, Afghanistan, Korea, etc., those uh, dead databases there with Veterans Affairs Canada, and they, uh, by putting in the surname and potentially uh, um, um, the given names and or the, uh, uh, not the regimental number, um, you can find that information and about eight to ten percent of them now have photographs because they're inviting the public to say that if you have a photograph send it to us and we'll load it up into the virtual memorial so uh, a great push has been happening in the last couple of years I think I've seen it go from about five percent now into the ten percent range and of course we can do better uh, and get more more pictures up there so there's the virtual memorial Next slide, please. And then it was mentioned tonight that uh, the Simcoe County Archives has now put together this new database listing, at this point, 1,006 names of First World War individuals that came from Simcoe County. So now we're starting to focus down into the county, where previously, if you went to the Library and Archives Canada databases, you could find out that, oh, this guy was from uh, Simcoe County. but. They've now put that all together and made it simple for us to just simply look at it. So you could put in like uh, Collingwood or Allendale and up will come a list of everybody who said, I'm from that area. So it's a great new find and it'll be a tool that I look forward to using. And I look forward to the day when we can start to work and put all the names of the individuals that not only paid the supreme sacrifice, but also volunteered and to start to load that up. Next slide, please. And I am a volunteer at the Grain Simple Foresters Regimental Museum in Barry on Mulcaster Street. Has anybody been to that, that museum here? A few? That's great. That's great. It's open till uh, the end of November, then it opens up again in May. And it's typically open for uh, about four or five days a week, Wednesday, Thursdays, through Saturdays, 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And they have a tremendous amount of information in there about First World War, Second World War, people that were great simple foresters, including those that fought in the First World War, known as the 157th Battalion and other battalion numbers. And uh, that museum, or excuse me, that building was built in 1888. We almost uh, had uh, a developer uh, <coughs> want to knock it down recently, but uh, 
because it's owned by the Barry uh, City, uh, it is now being protected and uh, we'll hope that it stands on its own for a few more years. <coughs> Next slide, please. In there, uh, uh, one of the past curators, Lauren Williams, has documented that he has 536 names of those that were great simple foresters that paid the supreme sacrifice over time. And um, so Gray County, Simcoe County, and uh, the vast majority are from the First World War. I think it's the last column and one half are World War II, and the rest essentially are World War I. 536 names in county. Next slide, please. And here is something I really am so pleased about. As uh, the public relations officer and branch historian at the uh, Barry Legion, uh, I found in an old uh, uh, box this photograph and it was of eight and a half by 11. And I turned it over and there was the surnames of every soldier in the front row and the back row. And so with uh, information from the Barry newspaper, the Examiner, and the Northern Advance, we were able to parcel that together and we now have 38 individuals. We've had that blown up. It's now on the Barry Legion uh, wall. And uh, uh, we do now honor for 38 men who were part of the 35th Simple Foresters, who weren't recognized by the Gray and Simple Foresters as being their soldiers because they had joined up with the 37th Battalion and went overseas before they raised their other battalions. And uh, so now we're digging out other stuff that will eventually say we have more than 536 names. Next slide, please. 1916, Simcoe County. You remember, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I do. 82,000 people. And you know what the biggest city was? Aurelia, standing at about 8,000 people. And next came Collingwood at 7,000 people. And Barry dragging out a third place position at 6,000. So <laughs> interesting, isn't it, when you look back? But out of a, out of a county of about 82,000 people, of course, half of them being women, uh, some of them being of age, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. The Simcoe County uh, Archives believes that roughly about 8,000 men enlisted from Simcoe County. We'll find out over time, I guess, if that's true or not. But that's amazing, the number of people, especially from a community with a lot of people that were into uh, farming and you know where they were somewhat protected from having to go overseas. But these men went over. Next slide, please. One of the battalions that the 35th Regiment was asked to raise, again, the 157th Battalion. And 20, almost 2,500 said, we're, we're ready to go. They just needed a, a, about 1,000 or so, 1,100 or so. They rejected 700 because they were medically unfit. Another 75 were transferred to another battalion that was wintering in the Barry Armies at the time, known as the 76th Battalion. And then they said, you know what? We'll raise another battalion and we'll give them a head start. Here's 600 guys that we don't need and we'll start the 177th Battalion. Now, I really like the names of the 157th, the 177th. Not like those PPCLI and the Red Royal Regiment of Canada. Why they didn't give these guys names and regiments to make them more proud instead of the 177th, the 157th. You don't get that something happening there. But essentially they were the Simcoe Foresters, and later the Grand Simcoe Foresters. Next slide, please. So these lads get together. They all train. They, they, they go through the training here in Canada. They make their way over to England. And like every other battalion that's coming in in the late part of 1916, they're told, sorry guys, you're not going to get to fight as a unit. You're going to be used, and we're going to move some of you out to the pre-existing battalions. So. Some of the men went to the 1st Battalion, some went to the 19th Battalion because of a politically arranged situation where the 116th Battalion had friends in high places, they got to stay together. But because they were all men from Ontario County or the Durham uh, uh, area of, of uh, Ontario, uh, they started to say, Let, let's move some of you guys around. Uh, and 400 men from Simcoe County were transferred into the 116th Battalion. And uh, the balance went into reserve eventually to, to go and serve as well. 
Next slide, please. So before Vimy, um, Tim Cook tells us that 15,000 of the men who had gone over, primarily in the first and second and third divisions, uh, were killed. 61,000 casualties in total, so about 25% of the casualties were killed. <coughs> and these are just a couple of, uh, of the cemeteries that I visited in uh, the battlefield tour in, in, in the Somme area in 2015. Next slide, please. One of the gentlemen who I did research and found out uh, was a guy named Fred Higgins from Hillsdale, Ontario. And he was involved in the Battle of St. Eloy, where he was part of the 2nd Division, and where the 2nd Division did not do so well. And he was taken prisoner, but he had taken a lot, a lot of shrapnel uh, issues. He lost an eye. So he was taken prisoner of war. He was operated five times in Germany. And then they decided that they would use him as a prisoner exchange. They gave him back to England, where he was sent in England three more operations to try and rectify his problems. And then it was determined that he needed to go home to Canada. And they operated on him <coughs> five more times in Canada. He then went to work in a munitions factory, because there's not too many pensions going on for somebody like that. He developed pneumonia, and he was put in hospital, and he died on July the 1st, 1918 at the age of 26. When I read his story, and I looked on the virtual memorial, I couldn't find a photograph of him. So I wrote to St. Uh, John's Anglican Church in Craighurst and asked if there was any family that was still there. And they said that they knew of somebody who was living down, I think, in the Caribbean. Um, her name was Sharon Maltar. And so they got in touch with her, and she said, yes, I have a photograph of him with his sister. And now this picture is on the virtual memorial. So I think I've done honor to that. Next slide. So before before Vimy, 61,000 casualties. Julian Bing, who's the British uh, officer running the Canadian Corps, which is about 100,000 men <coughs> in strength, just coming off the Somme in the fall or November of 1916. They've lost 24,000 men, casualties, in the Battle of the Somme, running from July through till November. And he's told, you're going to move into the Vimy sector in France now, and um, um, you're going to take the ridge in this, when the spring comes. The ridge, which has not been taken twice uh, by the Allies, the French first, and then the British, at great loss, and he's told, this will be your sector. And he's going, okay, another 24,000 I'm going to lose. Don't need that. So he looked around and he had his best general, Major General Arthur Curry, who was the division commander for the first division. And he had a general who was from uh, the University of Montreal, Andrew McNaughton, or McGill University, excuse me, a lieutenant colonel who was studied in science arts. And he said, you're my two primary guys. I want you to go and talk to the French who've been fighting at Verdun and learned what they learned and how they did things right, when they did things right. And also please talk to the British and try to learn what you can from them. And come back and let's see what we can put in play. Next one. So Andrew McNaughton went over and he determined that all they, they fired millions and millions of, of, of shells into the Battle of the Somme. The German defenses were so good that there was just nothing that was happening. These guys were down there. They would wait till the, uh, the, till the barrage was completed, and then up they would come with the guns, the, the machine guns, and mow down everybody. You might remember that on, I think it was July 1st, 1916, the worst day for the British Expeditionary Force, when they lost something like 50,000 men in one day. Crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, so he determined that it's more important to neutralize the enemy. If they're down there hiding, get your men out there, move the artillery uh, barrage in such a way as that your men are following the barrage so that when the barrage moves on, the men are on top of the enemy at that point and they don't have time to put their, their guns up. And of course, they were trying to perfect this over time. They also worked on a counter battery operation to look and determine by using uh, balloons, by using the Royal Flying Corps and using scientific data to study the wind and velocity to determine where the artillery of the enemy were located 
and then to pinpoint that down, and then when you're going to go and fight with an artillery barrage, make sure that you harass their artillery. McNaughton also uh, used sound uh, technicians so he could triangulate where the enemy uh, artillery was, and then they had them know and swear that they could uh, hit the counter battery before the uh, before the attack. Yes, indeed. That's indeed. He also was uh, uh, pleased to find that they developed the 106 fuse, which was something that they could use against barbed wire, so that whether artillery would, would go after the barbed wire, they could essentially get rid of that and make it easier for the infantry to move. Yeah, there's a tremendous study uh, on what he learned in all sorts of ways. Next slide, please. And Curry, uh, Arthur Curry, uh, he <coughs> determined that you have to have the platoons the smallest element out there on the battlefield, the 40 soldier platoons, they've got to be aware of the objectives. Just can't be the officers knowing what's going on. Everybody needs to know the objectives. And so as you talk about Vimy, something like 40,000 maps were handed out to the 100,000 uh, uh, infantry, infantry so that they would know what their objectives, where they were, what their role was. And then they said, okay, if you're a private and the corporal gets shot in front of you, you might have to take over that position. So what would, what would the corporal be needing to do at this point? What would the sergeant be needing to do? What would be the officers be needing to do? So everybody knows what everything else has to happen. And they brought in more uh, uh, items such as machine guns, bombs, grenadiers into the platoon area where previously at the Somme they were typically relying on just riflemen. Next slide, please. And so they prepared, and they had three months to prepare. The Germans looking down from the ridge, seeing everything that's happening during the daytime, but at nighttime they didn't see an awful lot that was happening because the men are building trenches, tunnels, creating gun emplacements, and then hiding them during the daytime. So three months, and Vimy was a city of 100,000, larger than Ottawa. <laughs> Amazing. Three months to prepare. 100,000 men, 50,000 horses, food, water, electricity, the whole nine yards. Next slide, please. Just a colorization photo from the Vimy Foundation, Canadian Machine Gunners. Next slide, please. And it worked. Three months, you get the plan, and the Canadian Corps, four divisions, essentially a Canadian battle, although I'd say about 50% of the men that were fighting had British blood in them. Uh, so they just happened to be wearing a Canadian epaulette uh, on, their, on, their, on, their, on their shoulders, but they were, they were all Canadian Corps, and the British artillery were helping them as well, but they took 10,600 casualties, and they gained the Vimy Ridge and never lost it for the rest of the war. They held the Vimy Ridge during that period. Julian Bing gets promoted, and he's asked, who should be the commander of the Canadian Corps? He said that Canadian fellow, Curry. Arthur Curry, who's knighted in June, and he takes command, the man from Strathroy, Ontario. Next slide, please. And so um, um, it's asked, and Tim Cook said, why should Canada remember Vimy Ridge? And he explains in his book called Shock Troops, April 9, 1917 was the single bloodiest day of the entire war for the Canadian Corps, and bloodiest of all Canadian military history, worse than Beaumont Hamel, where the Newfoundland Regiment uh, was decimated on July 1, 1916. Worse than Dieppe, when 5,000 Canadians went ashore uh, in uh, August 19th of 1942. And worse than D-Day, in fact, worse than all three combined. Next slide, please. A gentleman from Barrie named Ken, or Kenyon Lout, who was at Vimy received the Military Cross for his bravery, and then later, when he's at Passchendaele, receives a bar for that Military Cross, so it's a, uh, quite an honor, but nobody knows about him back in Barrie. Uh, we don't know where he's buried, we know nothing about who he is or what he was, and the only picture I can find of him is a picture that was in the newspaper at the time, uh, showing him and identifying that he was so brave, he's fighting for the 4th Battalion. He'd enlisted with the 76th, he would have been with the 157th, but one of those men that was sent over to work with the 76th. Uh, 
at the Battle of the Somme, he had some shrapnel wounds in the neck, but it was not so much that he could not fight at Vimy. And then while he received the military bar uh, at, uh, at Passchendaele, he also was suffering from shell shock, and he was returned to Canada in March 1918. And uh, this is the thing that I constantly try to do, is find stories about men from Simcoe County, and here's one on a man named Ken Lau. Everybody know about Lance Castle and Barry uh, in there? It's a beautiful building. I think it's what it was relative. It looks like a castle. Next slide, please. So, Vimy Ridge. Um, the Vimy Foundation wants everyone at, on April the 9th to wear a Vimy pin. That's what it looks like. But essentially, this is the uh, uh, item that represents the entire war. Uh, we don't have something that represents the entire war, so I, I look at the Vimy pin. It would be the same if you were thinking about World War II, although my dad was in the Italian campaign and a D-Day Dodger. People typically look at uh, D-Day in Normandy and think of that as the, the, the day we remember when we think about World War II or have a, a special tribute. But what they said here in 2003 that the federal government, government decreed that an act of parliament that 9 April would be Vimy Ridge Day every year and the Vimy Ridge uh, Foundation wants uh, everybody in Canada to wear these pins. We sell them at the uh, Barry Legion for $5. Next slide, please. Driving down near Campbellford, Ontario, as you cross the Trent River, is this monument to a single soldier, a private. His parents, Joseph and Victoria Cowan, farmers nearby, put that monument up sometime after the war to their son. And if you look through his war records, there's nothing outstanding that you can see. He did not win a military medal or a for bravery or anything like that, but he died, and that was their life and that was their son. And I thought that was interesting to see a single monument, huge, to a, a single private soldier. Next slide, please. Hill 70, a battle that occurred after Vimy <coughs> in August of uh, uh, 1917, now has a Canadian monument, 100th anniversary of Hill 70, and with lots of funding from the Prince of Wales' own regiment out of, out of uh, Kingston, Ontario, and others contributing. They now have a great monument there, and it indicates down below that there's the path leading up to the mine, stamped with 1,877 maple leaves, one for each of the Canadians that were killed in the Battle of Hill 70. Next slide. And this was the second largest Canadian military campaign of the war, and virtually nobody had heard of Hill 70 until last year when Bruce McGregor for the Globe and Mail wrote a number of articles about it and uh, also they, they came out with a book in print. But here it was, uh, Sir Arthur Curry's first time when he's managing a battle, he's told to take the city of Lens, not Hill 70. And he says, let me take this hill which overlooks the village of Lens or the town of Lens and if I can take the hill then it will be easier for me to take lands. Douglas Haig, who's the commander of the British Expeditionary Force, <coughs> wants him to do this as a diversionary attack to take pressure and divisions away from the battle he's now fighting up in uh, Belgium, the Third Battle of Ypres, also known as Passchendaele. And uh, it works, except um, he takes the Hill 70 and puts on major damage uh, to, the, to the German infantry to the point where they do move some of the divisions out of uh, Belgium, but he's unsuccessful in taking lands. And so it's a mixed blessing as far as his career is concerned, but he still has a lot to learn as the commander of the Canadian Corps. Next slide, please. So here's just a, a slide of an individual who I located a man from Stroud in Simcoe County. He's uh, with the artillery. And he writes home on August the 6th, I've been with the guns now 10 days and shall be going back to the wagon lines for a rest and a bath, in both of which I'm in great need. And unfortunately, he does return to battle, and on the 17th of August, uh, just a few days later, he's killed. 
and for some reason his name is not on the, the Barry Cenotaph. Next slide, please. Remember we talked about the 116th Battalion and the 400 men from Simcoe County were put into that. When Curry was getting ready for the battle at Hill 70, he called upon the 116th to do a, a raid, a trench raid, and uh, it was somewhat successful. 35 minutes of frenzied fighting, they say. He was trying to uh, ensure that the Germans would reinforce this particular area to make it easy to take Hill 70. And uh, they did take 74 casualties. But here now, next slide, is some of the story of Simcoe County men that were involved in this raid. All men with, originally with the 157th that were now with the 116th. So we have a Corporal Donald McLean receiving the Military Medal for conspicuous bravery. We have a British, that's fine, that we have a British home child, uh, many of the children known as Barnardo children, uh, who came from England and used essentially as, uh, some call it slave labor. My grandmother was a Bernardo child. If it was jumpy, go back. Um, she she uh, was a Bernardo child. But this gentleman here, who came from the, the slums of London, enlisted with the 157th, and uh, his body was never found, and uh, he was in, in on that raid. Next slide. And a number of men who are listed on the virtual <coughs> memorial, but we have no pictures. Uh, uh, a Private Ambrose Vincent Archer from Waverly, Private Campbell from Barrie, Gardner from Midland, Hinchcliffe from Aurelia, McCarroll from Coldwater, Wybridge, a gentleman in Montgomery, another gentleman from Midland, Harry <coughs> Paul, and uh, a gentleman from Penetang, Mr. Spruill. And uh, again, it would be great if we could find photographs for these men. Next slide. Moving on into 1917, the Battle of Passchendaele. Uh, after Hill 70, uh, Curry thought it was a chance for him to rest, but because things had gone so badly for the British up in uh, in Belgium, in the Third Battle of Ypres, uh, that uh, Sir Arthur Hague said, I need you. Uh, he started to limit his requirements down to the area called Passchendaele, but Passchendaele wasn't going to be that easy to take. And Curry said, if I have to fight at there, I'm going to lose 16,000 men. And the result was he did lose 15,654 over the last... Uh, uh, end of October through November. Next slide. Just a photograph of what uh, what they were facing, all torn up, rain, mud, clay, and uh, so many uh, artillery shells that how do you really fight in that environment? This is a photograph from August 1917. The Canadians aren't there till October, but it's no different when they arrive in October. Next slide, please. So in Passchendaele, Curry had 14 days to plan. 14 days compared to three months for Vimy and six weeks for Hill 70. So he knew that he was up against it here. It was going to be difficult. So, of course, he lost a lot of uh, men, almost 16,000. Roads had to be built across the swamps. Wooden pass, duck boards to give the infantry a fighting chance. Meanwhile, the Germans are watching all the time and lobbing artillery shells and blowing up the duck boards. And the Canadian labor groups that are out there who can't even fire back, 15,000 are casualties, or 1,500, excuse me, are casualties before the fighting begins. The engineering groups. Next slide, please. Gentlemen, Tommy Holmes, a Victoria Cross winner, born in Owen Sound, right up the, 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 uh, the Lake or Georgian Bay from here. He was with the 147th Battalion or the Gray County area and he won a Victoria Cross on the first day of the battle when the Canadians took it, October 26, and it reads Private Holmes on his own initiative rushed forward and tossed a bomb so accurately into the trench of the enemy machine gun crew that they and their guns were put out of action. He then returned to his companions for more bombs so he zigzagged back there's being fired at all the time. Gets back and says, give me another bomb. Zigzags back up. Throws it into a pillbox, into the entrance, explodes, kills some guys, and out come the rest of the guys with their hands up. 
and he wins the Victoria Cross. <laughs> Next slide, please. It's Lieutenant Tom Rutherford, also from Owen Sound. He's out there. He's got his pistol out. Come on, men, let's go. Turns around, finds himself into a portion of the German trenches, and nobody's with him. <laughs> That's okay. And this great big German soldier's coming at him. They wrestle. Somehow he's able to shoot the man with his revolver. And he looks around and he sees that the trench or the parapet way that the Germans are, they're up and they're, they're sniping the, the 4th Canadian Mounted Rifle guys, all his buddies from, uh, from uh, Gray County that are with him in the 4th CMRs. So he said he, he grabs the rifle, he's shaking like a leaf from cold and adrenaline, and he starts to snipe these German soldiers, and they don't even see that he's behind them, and he's taking them out, and eventually he gets it to such a point that all the CMRs are able to pour through and uh, he does not get a Victoria Cross because I guess somebody didn't rec recognize and reference what he did that day, but I think he damn well deserved one for what he did. Next slide, please. We talked about the 147th uh, Battalion, which was raised next door here in Gray County. This is just a photo of them walking down the streets of Meaford in 1916 on a recruiting drive. Next slide, please. And here's 29 names of men from Owen Sound, Meaford, Chatsworth, <coughs> etc. Next slide. And another 23 names from the same area, all killed in action at the Battle of Passchendaele. Total of 52 men from Gray County, uh, right around the corner. And if you think those were those who were killed, you know that the numbers for the wounded in action were four or five times greater than that. And the scars. Next slide, please. A gentleman from the Barry area, Lyle, Ontario area, who died on October 31, 1917. And in going through some of the other stuff at the, um, the Barry Legion, I found a clipping of, uh, go back to that slide, of, from 1957 from the Barry Examiner showing his mother and father placing a wreath uh, uh, on his, uh, at the Barry Cenotaph. They'd been doing that every year since the Cenotaph had been built. And uh, they honored his memory. I had a chance of meeting uh, a, a descendant of his a week or so ago and he was extremely pleased to find a picture of his, uh, his family and the honor of, of uh, recognizing him for so many years. Next slide, please. So now we're just going to move down to, to the end of the war. We're not going to talk about uh, the German um, uh, situation in the spring offensive that they had because of time. It's just not going to allow. Um, but uh, they had pushed themselves so far, they had done so well in their offensive, but they got farther ahead from their supply chain. And so they were out there and they were in the wrong area at the wrong time when the British offensive started to push forward, and uh, Sir Douglas Haig uh, started that in the uh, Battle of Amiens on August the 8th at 4.20 in the morning with the Canadians in front, the Australians beside them, and then the British and the French down the lines. So the Canadians are in front in this battle, and the battle begins at 4.20, and I'll just move to the next slide because it's the black day of the German army in the history of the war. Canadians advanced 13 kilometers where before you were moving in yards, you're now moving in 13 kilometers because they were just reeling. They had no idea what was coming. It was a big surprise. And the Australians and the French, they all moved further. And three German divisions are shattered. 5,000 are taken prisoners. And we take a number of casualties as well. But at this point in time, Ludendorff, the uh, leader of the uh, German army, realizes that the war is pretty much over and they need to do a fighting retreat and get back to where they could in the final lines in France and see if they could get to a winter where they could quiet down and they could try to reinforce again and come back fighting in 1919. Mm -hmm. For Sir Douglas Haig, no. It's time to push forward and so we're going to stay on the offensive. Next slide, please. And so we get into the last 100 days where we have battles at Arras at the end of August at uh, Canal du Nord, at Cambrai, 
through the September, October time frames. And over the last 96 days, which is called the last 100 days, um, from August 8th to November 11th, we take almost 46,000 casualties, which is one-eighth of the total casualties taken in the last 100 days by the British Expeditionary Force. But we represent one-fifteenth of the strength of that force. So we're, we're fighting above our weight at this point, but it's taking us great numbers and great losses. Next slide, please. A gentleman from this area, uh, Collingwood Township, Dugo Carmichael, I'm sure some of you recognize that name. He's um, out in the battle on the 28th of September, uh, and he's now commanding the 116th. He was with the 58th, but the commander of the 116th has been uh, hurt earlier in September, and so they have asked this major to take on to be the officer commanding the 116th. And so those 400 men that were from the Great Central Foresters, or what's left of them, are now under command of Major Dougal Carmichael, who's already won a DSO and a bar and a military cross and a bar. In fact, he's the most decorated Great Central Forester of all time. What does anybody know about it? So here it is on the 20th of September. He's in command of the battalion when he captured the western portion of St. Ali. Next day, he again attacks and clears the village. Some days later, while leading his battalion, he's badly wounded in the face, but remains on duty and presses on to Ramil, the final objective. <coughs> this fine courage and determined leadership inspired all of the Next slide, please. And here, all of these graves are men of the 116th Battalion in the, they're all killed on the 28th, 29th of September, many of the men from Simcoe County. Next slide, please. After the war is over, um, they've asked General Curry where he thinks they should put the great Canadian monument. What battlefield should see the primary Canadian monument? And he says in a letter to another soldier, if they place the large memorial at Vimy, it will confirm for all time the impression which exists in the minds of the majority of people of Canada that Vimy was the greatest battle fought by the Canadians in France. In my mind, that is very far from the fact. We fought other battles where the moral and material results <laughs> were far greater than Vimy's victory. Vimy was a set-piece battle, three months to prepare for it. We trained and rehearsed for weeks. We did not call for the same degree of resource and initiative that were displayed in the last 100 days, the greatest three battles, Amiens, Arras, and at Cambrai, also the Canal du Nord. Next slide, please. When we were moving into the year 2000, in 1999, I remember they had a contest that said, let's name the greatest 100 Canadians of all time. And, uh, Curry came in, I think it was number 15. He was beat out by Shania Twain, Don Cherry, <laughs> a few others, right? He was the greatest general. There was some thought that if the war had continued on to 1919, that he would give, be given command of the entire British Expeditionary Force. That's how uh, Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of England, was thinking about it. He believed that this man had the, 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 the will and the tape. He was impressed with by this man. But you know, in Canada, there's a collage of about 12 honored Canadians up in Ottawa near uh, the Canadian uh, uh, um, memorial for, for uh, battle. And he was one of them in there. And that was the only uh, statue we had for this man. But on the anniversary of the first year of the war, August 4th, 2014, 1914, in the anniversary, in his hometown, I was there, and we uh, a statue was put up in honor of him. And you know if he was an American general, a couple of universities, an airport, and uh, maybe even a town or two named after him, right? But not our man, General Arthur Curry. We Canadians, we say sorry. <laughs> Next slide, please. And here, uh, my second last slide, this is a gentleman named Bert Atkins. He was also with the 116th Battalion. He made it through the war. His niece uh, came into the Mulcaster Museum and um, uh, talked to me and 
learn, and she told me that she had a, a photograph of him and that she would send it to me. And here he is, he's born in England. He comes to Canada in 1907, settles at Penetang, worked as a sailor on the Great Lakes. I'm sure he called into port here from time to time. He enlists with the 157th Battalion, makes it through the war, but I well remember my mother telling me that Bert came home shell-shocked from overseas duty with what today we would call PTSD. Uh, look at that, typo, typo, post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD. Bert was sent to a sanitarium near Kingston, Ontario, and then later he died in 1941. And I thought about it. His friends were in that raid in 1917 at Hill 70. I'm sure he was in that raid too. Dougal Carmichael had the 116th or the remnants of the 116th fighting in the Canal du Nord. And you saw those graves of the 116th. What this man saw, although he didn't get a military cross, he came home and he really reflects what it was like to have fought in the First World War. We all know they never talked about it. We all know that our fathers, or my father, in the First World War never talked about the war. And there was good reason for it. Last slide, please. In honor of the Collingwood shipbuilding, I can't sing, I can't play. <laughs> but uh, I thought this was great. I've seen this on so many of the, of the uh, virtual memorial sites for the soldiers that did come from this area. And here is a list from the Collingwood shipbuilding area. Not only those that paid the supreme sacrifice, but those that enlisted. And I thought it was a, a final tribute and a final slide. Thank you. Thank you.